Hello, and it's uh, great that you can join us today for our service. This is the first Sunday in June, and it's Trinity Sunday. Uh, we've got various people joining us later on in the service, and Paul is going to be bringing us his message. Um, but now it's um, over to John, who is reading Psalm 8. Psalm 8 O Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. You have taught children and infants to tell of your strengths, silencing your enemies and all who oppose you. When I look at the night sky and see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you set in place, what are mere mortals that you should think about them, human beings that you should care for them? You made them only a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honour. You gave them charge of everything you made, putting all things under their authority. The flocks and the herds and all the wild animals, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea and everything that swims the ocean currents. O Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. Let's pray. Lord God, Yahweh, almighty, powerful King of the universe, the heavens and the earth, our Adonai, our King, you are very great and very strong. We give you thanks because you have shown yourself to be, and we know you are majesty you control the universe that you made you designed created and placed the billions upon billions of stars on display with your fingers you named each one you maintain them and everything else 
He also made each one of us, whether we are old or young, tiny or in the womb, you alone are strong. You honoured us by coming to earth from your throne. You were crowned with our crown of thorns, the symbol of our sin. By God's plan, you tasted our death. One day all crowns will be laid at your feet. King Jesus, your word says we matter to you and are constantly on your mind. We don't deserve your attention. We are weak and insignificant. Every day we think wrong thoughts about you because we don't know your character sufficiently. Every day we have wrong motives and desires because we don't love you enough. Every day we do harm because we don't fully trust in you. King Jesus, have mercy on us. Amen. Well, hello, I'm uh, with Tony Ruddle, who is called our Northern Baptist Association moderator. And uh, I'd like to find out a bit more about Tony. So Tony, first of all, what is a moderator? Hello, yes, a moderator. Uh, a moderator really, in simple forms, is someone who's appointed as a chair of a council meeting for the Northern Baptist Association. And I suppose you might think it's as simple as chairing meetings, but it's not quite like that. In fact, um, there's a management role of um, the team leader, um, but it's more about support and encouragement, perhaps a challenge if necessary. Um, and there's also in the background uh, supporting the various parts of the council. And in this particular time uh, of John retiring in 2021, there's uh, the management of getting the transition underway and possibly to completion, but probably short of that at the moment. Okay, well, thank you for that and that little brief insight into that. As I listen to you, Tony, I realise that your dulcet tones are not that of a, of a, of a northerner. Uh, so tell us where you're from. So um, I'm originally a Londoner, but uh, some people can't detect that these days uh, because we've moved around a lot. So where have you been? Um, well, South London uh, as a child um, and uh, early adulthood, then Trinidad for a year on voluntary service overseas, um, back to London, working for a couple of years in the civil service. Uh, then Spurgeon's College for four years and after ordination um, as an intern in uh, Dallas, Texas for a year, back to England, Chelmsford, Essex, then back to London, then Grantham for 14 years and Leeds for 20 years as the Deputy Head of Chaplaincy at Leeds Teaching Hospitals. And then finally, we're up here uh, in these wonderful countryside of uh, Tyne and Weir. I almost got lost trying to follow you follow you on my imaginary map as to where you'd actually been. You mentioned uh, ordination and, and I assume therefore Christian ministry. At some point you must have decided to follow Jesus. Um, how did that happen for you? Um, very early uh, and very clearly when I was seven um, I recognised uh, through a talk by a little guy called Mr Sparrow um, in church on a church anniversary um, not that he made me feel guilty, but I knew already that there were things that I had done wrong that hadn't been pleasing to my parents and not pleasing to God. But it just the way he presented the talk that day, it just hit me in my heart. And uh, I was I was fortunate. We were going off to lunch to a friend's house and my dad wisely said, don't talk to me about it. Talk to Uncle Ron. Um, and so there was no pressure. And I was just led through some simple steps. And I, I asked Jesus into my life and it's made a fantastic difference all my life. And all I'm your so life. Grateful. So you've been following Jesus a long time. Um, I wonder if over those years there's a particular highlight you'd like to share with us. I think there are two highlights really. Uh, one, one is um, my baptismal service, um, which uh, amazingly at Pollard Hill Baptist Church in Mitcham, uh, we were sitting there waiting for the service to start and suddenly uh, my friend's dad and my dad looked at one another and said, 
hey, isn't this the same date that we were baptised together 25 years ago in a church in West Norwood? And we'd all only just been in the church for a short time, so there'd been no conversation about it. You just realised on that night, and it just added something to it about the faithfulness of God through the generations uh, and, and beyond. And um, that just lifted me uh, and mm. gave me a lot of encouragement. Yeah. Um, and the second one was uh, the ordination service in the same church. And our uh, minister, Desmond Jackson, DJ to us, uh, he died just two weeks before my ordination. And I was really sad about that because he's been a great mentor and encourager. And um, when I knelt to be ordained, um, George Beasley Murray, the principal of Spurgeon's College, put his hands on my head. But I didn't feel just one set of hands. I felt two. Now, you okay. can say it was imagination. But yeah. was it DJ? Or was it the Lord Jesus? I don't mind which. Both of them were God acting on my behalf, as it were. And uh, I was greatly encouraged. And I've always looked back at that and said, there's, there's no way that I'm ever going back on my call to following Jesus because of that. That's great. And it's really good to have those, those things that you can hold on to that um, are things that remind you of God actually helping you at particular times in your life. Yeah. Yeah. And Tony, here we are now, and, and you're in lovely retirement, and uh, uh, they're living in Whitley Bay, but we've all been blighted, really, by this thing called the corona crisis and, and lockdown. And so I just wonder, how has, how has Jesus been relevant to you during this time? So there are, there are two things that um, I find that are relevant because they help me from the past in the present. The first is when I was 14, just after I was baptised, so it was a real testing time. Um, I had a leg injury and I was locked in at home for five months. Wasn't allowed out, had to just keep it up on the bed or on the couch. Um, and I found uh, God's presence and God's love, not only personally, but in the presence of others, in that my minister DJ very kindly came and visited once a week. And then a couple of times a week, he sent an elderly gentleman who used to come and play cribbage with me and chess. And they didn't have to do that, but they did it out of the love and compassion for a young person who was locked in. So I found that helpful. Um, and it prepared me for moments when the, you're, you're isolated and alone. The second one was um, when between our two uh, sons, we had a little girl called Emily and she sadly died at three weeks. Mm -hmm. But there were experiences in that moment uh, of God's presence, God's care um, directly and through his people that really uh, told me that I was not alone and that I could depend upon him in any situation and any time to walk like that. Um, and he was there. And so very much um, I found in the present moment now that there's uh, some prayers I've been using um, that I only learnt and was introduced to right at the beginning of this lockdown time, which have been very, very helpful along the way, and, and one or two of the prayers in particular. Okay, thank you, Tony. And, and so there's, there's difficult and demanding uh, situations of the past that you've known God's faithful, faithfulness in, as well as the richness of, of new prayers being learnt uh, recently. And uh, all that just speaks to us of, of Jesus being faithful to us, upholding us, uh, and being with us. Thank you very much for what you shared, Tony. Hello. Today is Trinity Sunday. It's a Sunday of the year when Christians, above all other days, wrestle and boggle their minds with the mystery of God. Who is this God that we believe in and that we worship? What is the nature of the God whom we devote our lives to? And we think of God as Trinity, as Father, Son and Holy Spirit. A God who has revealed himself in this way through the Bible. We see in the book of Genesis when God creates the heavens and the earth. God the Father, the creator. Uh, the language that's used is the royal we. Let us create humankind in our own image. Humans, plural, because there is something of plurality in God. In the Gospels we read of course of Jesus. Jesus who claimed, astounding claims, 
who said, If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. I and the Father are one who accepted worship from Thomas, my Lord and my God. And the disciples increasingly came to realise and recognise that he was more than just human, that he had come from God, was God's son and was God himself. Paul says it like this, he is the image of the invisible God. The Greek word is icon. He is the likeness in flesh and blood of God who is unseen. And then, of course, at the end of the Gospels and into the Epistles, uh, we are introduced to the Holy Spirit. God, who, as we celebrated last week at Pentecost, comes and dwells within us in tongues of fire with a mighty wind, who empowers us to be God's witnesses. God living within us, us living within God. So although the doctrine wasn't formulated till many centuries afterwards, Nevertheless, the witness of the Christian scriptures is that God is more than just single. God is unique and only, but God is also plurality. And of course, over the years, there have been many attempts at analogies, saying that uh, the Trinity is maybe like the three parts of an egg or the three states of matter, water, ice, uh, water and steam. And if you go on holiday to places like Iceland, when the lockdown is over, then you can see all three at once together. Or using an analogy from physics, how light can be both waves and particles at the same time. But they're all analogies, and none of them actually get to the real heart of what the mystery of God's person is. We will never understand it. And we have to say, God, you are beyond us in many ways. We grasp aspects of you. We grasp um, pieces of the pi picture, but there are many parts of the puzzle that we have yet to fully understand. One of the other ways in which Christians have tried to explain the Trinity is through art, through images. And the most famous, probably, of these is a G Russian Orthodox icon painted by Andrei Rublev, the icon of the Trinity. And it depicts three characters, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, seated around a table in a circle, in an open gesture, inviting the viewer in to join and participate in this relationship of love between the three persons. We're just going to pause for a moment and I'm going to put the uh, picture onto uh, the screen for you to look at and just have a think about what you can learn about the Trinity. What does the symbolism of this picture say about God's nature and character? We're now going to come to our Bible passage for today, and it's very kindly read for us by Julia Monument of Billingham Baptist Church. Thanks very much, Julia. Good morning, everybody. Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 to 20 from the Message Translation. Meanwhile, the eleven disciples were on their way to Galilee, headed for the mountain Jesus had set for their reunion. The moment they saw him, they worshipped him. Some, though, held back, not sure about worship, about risking themselves totally. Jesus, undeterred, went right ahead and gave his charge. 
God authorised and commanded me to commission you. Go out and train everyone you meet, far and near, in this way of life, marking them by baptism in the threefold name, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Then instruct them in the practice of all I have commanded you. I will be with you as you do this, day after day, right up until the end of the age. Amen. So what can we learn about God as Trinity and our response to this God from this particular Bible passage? Well, Matthew starts off by saying that the 11 disciples were on their way to Galilee. They were headed for the mountain where Jesus had set for their reunion. And the moment they saw him, they worshipped him. Some, though, held back, not sure about worship about risking themselves totally. So there's something about this God who is Father, Son and Spirit that inspires worship because God is other, because God is different, because God is not like us and God is beyond us and more than us and mysterious and wonderful. And so a right response is worship to fall down in wonder and adoration. For the disciples, it was meeting a resurrected Jesus, a Jesus they'd seen executed and now raised back to life, proving that he was more than merely a human being. But at the same time, these followers of Jesus, these friends of Jesus, their worship is mingled with doubt. They hold back. And I guess when we encounter mystery, when we encounter things we don't understand, we might hold back. And maybe some of us hold back from really following Jesus, from trusting in God wholeheartedly. There can be all kinds of reasons why we hold back. Maybe we've had bad experiences in life. How can a good God allow me to suffer in the way that I have, or those that I love to have suffered in the way that they have? Maybe we've simply had a lack of experience. We just haven't really found God along the way. God has remained a bit too elusive and mysterious for us. Maybe we've had intellectual difficulties, that the language of faith somehow for us does not um, mesh with the, uh, the language of uh, materialism and science uh, that, that we have uh, that dominates society so much today. Maybe we hold back because we don't see the church as relevant at all. It's just peripheral. There's people in, in a little building doing their own thing on Sundays. It doesn't impact the rest of us, thank you very much. Or maybe we hold back simply because we are reluctant and maybe afraid and don't want to let this God, this mysterious God, get involved in our lives. It might mean we have to change. It might mean that some things have to go and new things that we're not aware of yet have to come. And to be honest, every single person who comes to faith in Christ, and I'm no different, We'll always have a few doubts and unanswered questions and a bit of mystery when they come to that point of faith. But it's about getting to that point where you've seen and heard and got to know enough of God to trust, yes, that this God, for all the mystery, is a good God who does good things. Whenever he works in our lives and in the world, and even in the midst of suffering, is still working for good. And this God is a loving God who cares about us, who loves us, even when we find it's hard at times to love ourselves, who loves us no matter what we've done, how we've lived our lives, whose love is a guarantee. This is the God that is revealed to us in Jesus Christ, made known through the Holy Spirit, revealed in creation. And so may this God come to you in the midst of your doubts and your uncertainties and lead you to worship. So let's pause and just consider for a moment or two what are those things that enable you to worship and acknowledge God and what are those things that just cause you to hold back and how might God overcome those things? <laughs>
So, coming back to our Bible passage. The first point is there is faith and doubt mixed together when we encounter God who is Trinity. The second point is that there is a job to do. Jesus says, God has authorised and commanded me to commission you. Jesus in another version of it says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. In other words, I can do anything I want. I have all power at my command. Anything that God does, I can do. Now just imagine having all the power in the universe that nothing else can stop. It's the dream of the, the Hollywood bad guys, isn't it? Or maybe it's the dream of every one of us deep down. If I could do the things that are impossible to do, what would you do if you could make anything happen? If you could change this world, if you could change the universe? And Jesus has, throughout his ministry, been proclaiming the kingdom of God coming. A kingdom where the poor are lifted up and, uh, and are blessed. Where those who are in prison are set free. Where those who have infirmities like blindness uh, are, are given their sight back. Where there is justice. Where things are set right. And here's Jesus, given all this authority, he can do whatever he wants. Is he now going to set the world right? Well, not quite. In fact, he, he almost like presses the pause button. We're waiting for Jesus to say, right, kazam, the world is now finally the way it should be. But no, he says, I'm going to leave. I'm not going to be around to do this in person. I'm giving the job to you to do. You are the ones who are going to bring justice. You are the ones who are going to bring faith. You are the ones who are going to help others to follow me and believe in me and trust in me and live the way that I want people to live. I wonder how you feel about that challenge. Somehow it feels a bit wrong. Jesus, you could do it so much easier yourself. Why are you choosing to get us involved? Because let's face it, we make mistakes. We get it wrong. We make as many problems as we provide solutions. Just look at what is happening in the world at the moment. We have at least in part brought coronavirus upon ourselves by uh, eating things that we shouldn't eat or uh, by not having good standards of hygiene and protection and healthcare, etc, etc. And of course we see the rioting uh, uh, over the injustice of a black man, George Floyd, put to death going on not just now in the States but all around the world. We see all kinds of problems created by humans. Jesus, why are you giving the job of putting the world right into our hands? <clears throat> and as we see, it's taken at least 2,000 years for people following Jesus to get on with the job, and still it ain't finished yet. It's taking an awful lot longer than if God were doing it himself. So why is he doing this? Why does he give the job to us? Well, it's a bit like that icon that we looked at earlier. It's like God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit are there building and growing this wonderful kingdom, this kingdom of justice and righteousness, of peace, of love, of beauty and splendour, of harmony. And they're inviting you and me into that circle, into that work. We have the privilege of being part of the work of God. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing to be invited in to be co-workers with this God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And of course, because God is giving us time, it enables more generations of people to be able to have the opportunity to be part of this wonderful project. And so Jesus then goes and says to his followers, to me and to you, if you choose to follow Jesus, go out and train everyone you meet far and near in this way of life. Because God, <coughs> Father, Son and Holy Spirit, is a mission-focused God. God the Father sends his Son Jesus into this world to reveal the invisible God to us. God the Father and Jesus the Son at Pentecost send the Holy Spirit upon the church to empower us to do the job that he gives us to do. God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit send his people, the church, the followers of Jesus, out into the world. So even in lockdown, 
We have this job. We have this task. We are to go. The natural state of the church is to go out into ever further concentric circles and make a difference in this world, to be part of God's project, to put this world right again. If the church is not going out, then it is not being authentically the church. Even in times of lockdown, we are still called to go out and find ways to reach out and engage with putting the world back to the right way it should be. We train everybody and we mark them, says Jesus, by baptism in this threefold name, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Baptism, being immersed into water, is a powerful symbolic act which represents a person immersing their life into this Trinitarian God, into God who is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And when we immerse our lives into God, we're immersing ourselves into a being who's totally full of love. There is this perfect relationship of love between Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And that love overflows into our lives when we immerse ourselves into Father, Son and Holy Spirit. We experience this wonderful, powerful love. And that is powerfully demonstrated in baptism. So I just wonder, this Trinity Sunday, whether you are in a place where you can more fully or maybe for the first time, immerse yourself into this love life of God, which is available for you, inviting you in. And maybe for you, if you've never been baptised, this is the time for you to think about getting immersed in water as a way of immersing your life totally into the life of God. Let's pause again and consider these things for a moment or two. We return a final time to our Bible passage. God the Trinity, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, they elicit a response of faith and sometimes doubt. God gives us a job to do and finally God promises fullness of life. Let's turn to Jesus' final words in that passage. He says, I will be with you as you do this job of making disciples of followers of all nations. I will be with you day after day after day, right up until the end of the age. What a fantastic promise. One of the best promises in the whole of the Bible. That even now, even this day, Jesus promises he is with you. He is with me. He is present. Even though we cannot see him by his spirit, he is with us, with us, for us, alongside us, accompanying us, empowering us, enabling us, leading us on. We're not doing this job on our own. We're not living life on our own. We're not trying to navigate coronavirus on our own. Jesus is with us day after day after day. Take that to heart again this day. This saying is a reminder that uh, he is indeed more than just a human being. Jesus is claiming that he is omnipresent, that he is with all people at all times, in all places, right through all of history. 
he is able to be present. Only God can do that. And so Jesus is showing that he is indeed divine. He is part of this wonderful triune God. He is also saying another oh, omnipotent, that he can do all things. All authority has been given to me. I can do all things, says Jesus. God has authorised me to be his agent. Everything God does, Jesus does, and vice versa. And likewise the Spirit. And then finally, a third O, which is used of God, Jesus is omniscient. He knows all things. Jesus says here, I will be with you right up until the very end of the age. I know all that's going to happen in all of human history, in effect. That's implied in what he says. And he knows you. And he knows me. He knows your situation. He knows mine. He knows everything about us. All our joys, our sorrows, our hopes, our fears, the things that we're facing and thinking and feeling this day. He knows it all and he is with us. So take that to heart. And in this lockdown, in this continuing situation, may you be aware of that presence of the Lord Jesus, God by his spirit, with you. Answering your prayers, showing you something of his beauty and glory in, in the creation around us. Maybe in the stillness and quietness, in the reflections that you have of your situation, your sense his presence. So let's pause one last time and use this time to ask how you can be aware of the presence of Jesus and of the Father, and of the Holy Spirit, this day and onwards. Thanks for listening. God bless you, and be with you as he promises. Amen.
from 2 Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Amen. <laughs>